I am thrilled to be joined for by an all-star, shall I call it a criminal justice panel. Uh, we have for the first time on Bad Faith Podcast, Matthew Clare. He's an assistant professor of sociology at Stanford University and author of the acclaimed Privilege and Punishment, How Race and Class Matter in Criminal Court. Welcome, Matthew. Thanks for having me. Or I should say Professor Claire. My apologies. I should <laughs> confess to the audience that uh, I've known Matthew since he was about two years old. So yeah, basically your younger siblings. <laughs> exactly. so, you know. so I apologize for any lapses in uh, professionalism. Um, and also for the first time on Bad Faith podcast, Kamau Franklin, who was founder of Community Movement Builders, an organization that was originally based out of New York, if I understand it, but is now in Atlanta, which is germane to some of the subjects we'll be talking about today. And also co-founder of Black Power Media. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Okay, so the reason I said that the Atlanta connection is of relevance is because one of the stories that obviously has been at the center of a contemporary conversation about criminal justice reform is Cop City. Kamal, can you set up a little bit for those who haven't been following the story very closely, what Cop City is and why um, protests around uh, the building of this hit a tipping point uh, last month? I'll I'll try to be as succinct as possible. So Cop City came out of the 2020 uprisings around the country that were, uh, you know, around after the killing of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, here in Atlanta, Rashad uh, Brooks. So after that killing, uh, and people were hitting the streets, uh, the city itself decided to put together a plan with the Atlanta Police Department, the Atlanta uh, um, Police Foundation, the city of Atlanta itself, and corporations with which it was close to, to put together this idea was already in the formation, but to make it public, the idea of building this cop city. And the reason that they gave at the very beginning for building this cop city was to help support the morale of the police. This is their words, not ours. Mm. Um, and so the building of cop city is, an, is, is something that they're planning to do, which they're uh, probably almost starting as we speak, um, as a police training center, as they term it, um, and we term it as a militarized base, which is meant to do two things quickly. One is to continue on in the tactics of over-policing black and brown communities here in Atlanta uh, and to have that training be something that goes across the country and even internationally. And I say that because 43 percent of the recruits who are going to be trained at Cop City whenever it's built will be from police who are not located here in Georgia, but from around the country. Mm. Secondly, coming out of the uprisings of 2020, the idea of Cop City, we believe, and information we think backs this, is really to stop movements, to stop movements against police violence. Uh, Part of the things that they're going to build, there are two mock cities to learn crowd control. Uh, They're learning tactics. They already have an ongoing relationship with the Israeli police, where they're exchanging tactics with the Israeli police. And so the same tactics that are being used against Palestinians are going to be brought home here. And the same tactics used here are going to be brought to Palestinians. I mean, for a lot of leftists listening to that, you don't have to say anything more to indicate that that's insidious. You know, red flags are already going off. But for people who might say, oh, well, maybe 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 Israelis are just really good at crowd control. Maybe they figured out something that we should know. Maybe Krav, Krav Magra or whatever it's called works. You know, why should people be concerned about importing those kinds of techniques in particular to an American context, into a, a civilian context? Yeah, I think the, the, the main thing is that what we have here is the police who are learning militarized and military type training tactics and strategies and techniques. And so part of this training facility is it's going to be equipped with military grade hardware and weapons. Again, these police are coming from all across the country to train with Israeli police to learn these tactics. So this is not just simply about um, learning uh, uh, investigative techniques. These are pertinent to the idea of after the 2020 uprisings, when people were out in the street, Atlanta and the rest of the country felt like the police were behind, right? Other police uh, police, uh, um, uh, places or whatever felt like this place was behind and that it was not necessarily doing what it wanted to do to stop people from having movements in the street. And so these tactics, which are used against Palestinians in terms of demonstrations and marches um, and, and civil disobedience and direct action, these are the tactics that they are learning and training with each other in order to stop movements from developing. 
So a lot of national attention became focused on Cop City um, just this past month because a protester uh, who's known as Tortuguita was killed. An autopsy report was actually just released earlier today as we're recording, showing that he was shot at least 13 times by the police. The police claim that they were returning fire from him, although his family disputes that. And there is a lack of evidence here because body cameras were not turned on. The family and allies of um, the deceased are pushing for an in independent investigation thus far not forthcoming. Matthew, you know, you write about, you know, how race and class affect people's fate once they're in the criminal justice system. And one half of this is obviously people who have been accused of criminal wrongdoing. Another part of this this um, puzzle is how police officers are treated when they are caught up in the criminal justice system because they've been accused of using excessive force. And I wonder what you make of certain patterns, perhaps, that are, are coming out now. One, the way that the media tends to take the police reports and report them as fact, uh, regardless of what the truth actually is. And two, how the police having the backing of the police departments, the installation of qualified immunity, et cetera, predicts that instances like these will play out in the long run. Yeah, you know, there's a long history, right, of this in the media and in journalism of sort of deferring to police accounts of what's happening in these incidents that have gone viral and even incidents that don't go viral and that we don't know much about. And I think what's happened over the past 10 years or so, and really motivated by the movement for Black Lives, is there's been increasing understanding among journalists that they can't simply defer to police accounts. And partly that's because of contradicting evidence, not just from body camera footage that sort of shows a slightly more, although not quite objective either reality, but slightly more than an individual's account of events, but also community contestation, right, of what's happening on the ground. So we saw this around George Floyd. We've seen this in so many other incidents of police violence and police murder, where there are community members, neighbors, family members, citizens who are recording, who show up to testify, right, to and against it in contradiction to police testimony, which historically in courts has been highly deferred to by judges, um, not only in these highly viral incidents of police abuse and violence, but also sort of in the routine every day of what's happening in our criminal courts. Um, so, you know, just routine everyday sort of violence that happens in our criminal courts. Someone's arrested for whatever alleged crime and police are called to testify. Um, and really we're deferring to police testimony and accounts rather than listening to the person who has been pulled into the criminal legal system because they're not thought of as credible. But what's so interesting is that even with the body cam evidence, I mean, this reminds me of um, uh, Patrice Cullors' uh, was it his cousin who was recently involved in, in one of these incidents, Keenan Anderson, who was, did, did you guys watch this footage? I'm sorry, I know it's, it's so many of these and it's mm -hmm. horrible to have to, you know, go through it. LAPD Chief Michael Moore says the department is considering changes to its use of tasers policy. Earlier this month, Keenan Anderson, a 31-year-old teacher, was tased by officers during an arrest and later died. Our Sophie Flay reports. This week, extended body cam footage of 31-year-old Keenan Anderson released by LAPD. You're trying to join for me. Stop it. Stop it. I'm going to tase you. Anderson died after being tased multiple times by an LAPD officer earlier this month. I'm going to tase him. Yeah. The number of times the taser was used is being questioned by his family and their attorney. Six times in 42 seconds. This is dangerous, potentially fatal. The Los Angeles Police Commission discussing their current taser policy today. As a department, we have no limit as far as the number of taser activations. We follow them closely and we evaluate the activation of each one. This body cam footage shows police trying to arrest Anderson for a hit and run after causing a traffic accident and trying to get in someone else's car in Venice. He initially complies with officers, then tries to flee. Anderson is then surrounded by officers and tased until he appears limp. Just lay on your side, you're fine. Unable to stand on his own, he's handed off to EMTs. Four and a half hours later, Anderson died in the hospital due to cardiac arrest. Police are still waiting for a completed autopsy report, but say cocaine and marijuana were found in his system. We are considering uh, uh, changes uh, to our policy, looking at evaluating whether that 
uh, limit, if you will, would be effective. But in, in the footage, he is apparently there was a, a some kind of traffic incident. The cops were called as disputed by who the last time I checked. And in the in the body cam footage, you see him at some point kneeling with his hands behind his head. And then he says to the cops, I want to be seen or something along those lines and kind of gets up and moves into the street basically saying that if something goes down, he doesn't want to, he doesn't want to be George Floyd. He doesn't want to be the victim of police brutality. Of course, he ends up getting tased. I think it was six times in 30 seconds or some, some obscene amount of times at uh, times in under a minute and ended up dying um, as a consequence. And when I covered that on rising and talked about it with my co-host, what was so interesting that my perception of him was that he didn't want to be killed. And so he was trying to make the interaction with the police more public. My co-host perception was, and, and what many people have said online since, is that he was fleeing, right? That he didn't obey orders. He got up and he was like running, running into the street, like running away, as opposed to trying to get be, be more visible in the middle of the street. And so I guess I wonder, Matthew, you know, how does this evidence, I mean, can you talk to us a little bit about how even this kind of relatively objective evidence ends up playing out in the context of the criminal justice system. Because again, when we're talking about, let's say, even the um, um, the, the most recent horrible, uh, brooding, brutal killing of uh, Tyree, oh Nichols. Ty Tyree Nichols, excuse yeah, me, yeah, yep. of Tyree Nichols, that the fact of there being five black cops even has made a lot of people mm -hmm. say that there's nothing kind of biased about how any of this will play out. What yeah. I mean, what do you say to that? Yeah, I mean, sort of on the first point about body cam footage and, you know, I think there are two sort of things that are happening here. So on one end, it's a good thing that we have this footage. It allows us to be able to have more eyes on, on the street of what's happening. At the same time, this is not clearly going to prevent violence, right? We have footage of violence happening, of people dying. And so body cams as a solution or a reform are largely ineffective. There are some studies that show that body cam footage you know, when they're on police departments, uh, you know, some experimental studies that show that, you know, when they're actually on and working, uh, police do engage in less and fewer forms of violence. Complaints might be reduced in a community, mm -hmm. but they don't prevent violence, right? And then you have this issue where you have alternative accounts. So even when we have body camera footage, people can come to different conclusions about what happened because this footage isn't showing everything. It's not showing what happened preceding, right, the body camera footage. It's not showing what happened after the fact. And then I also think what's really uh, even more uh, sort of depressing with regard to what's happening both in Tyree Nichols' case and then in the previous case, um, I'm blanking on the name of the person, but um, where he's in the street, and I only saw this actually because of your rising uh, conversation. Uh, to be uh, frank, you know, seeing these things, I try not to see them. Mm. But, you know, I just listen and, and listen to what's happening on the ground. But I, it's really hard for me to watch these um, th this video footage, but... What I saw there was also the use of tasers, right? And this happened both in both incidents. And often the use of tasers was sort of this model of we can reduce police killings and shootings in particular through the implementation of tasers. But what we're seeing and what good research has shown from uh, colleagues of mine at the University of Texas, Austin, for example, who shows that actually tasers, when they're implemented in police departments, are actually used more often because the idea among police officers is they're going to use tasers in situations where they may have not used a gun in the first place. They mm -hmm. may have other tactics to try to de-escalate potentially. And now they're using tasers, which can kill people as well. Um, so I see a lot of problems in both of these incidents and situations, but on the point of sort of interpretation, right, of evidence and how that plays in courts, I mean, juries also have been historically very deferential to police testimony. So even if you see body camera footage like we've seen in these situations, juries, however, can still really be uh, pulled in by police uh, saying that they had reasonable fear, that they, you know, were acting in self-defense talking about things that are happening outside of the video context that we see to be able to contextualize and justify, right, their, what I think of as unreasonable use of force. Um, so these are some of the problems that are in, in both of these videos, I think. Yeah, I mean, that, that reasonable fear standard, that kind of subjective, reasonable police officer standard has in it built in a preference for a police officer's perspective, right? Who d gets to determine what is a reasonable amount of fear and the the kind of diversity of opinion 
that it even came out in the rising segment segment on what we were looking at in that video can lead you very quickly to see how the it's the, the the game is stacked. The game is stacked in favor of a police department, police officers, who of course are going to be able to say, well, I I reasonably believe my life was at stake and therefore I I used lethal force. Coming back to this this um cop city example, Kamal, I, I I wonder if you can speak to a little bit to the scale of this thing. Um, and why and how long the protesters had been there in the first instance. What was it, almost, what, 90 acres of green land that was targeted for conversion to this training camp? Yeah, so far they're, they're, they're renting over 300 acres to the Atlanta uh, Police Foundation. And in addition to that, uh, uh, well, within that, they, they're cutting down immediately 90 acres of this particular forest. Um, and then they, there's nothing in the lease that prevents them for in the future cutting down more acreage uh, for them to put more structures or buildings on that site. Um, and what's important here is also to remember that this forest is adjacent to a working class black community, uh, a, a community that's over 70 percent black, a community who was promised not only access to this forest, but use of this forest for playgrounds, walking trails, there's a creek. Um, that All those plans went out the window when they decided to turn this force over to the police foundation for their usage. Um, and so we've been protesting since 2021, right after the idea was uh, sort of leaked out, because at first they weren't trying to have any public debates or discussions or town hall meetings. But once it became known information, those of us who are organizers and activists from various communities and different perspectives, we all saw two things. We saw, again, a base that was meant to mil be militarized and to continue to over-police our community. And part of your discussion prior, you know, the, the, the idea that our community is criminalized, right, mm -hmm. um, is part of the idea that both the police or the criminalization of our community, I should say, is the idea that the police go into it that the courts and the juries go into it with, um, and that every day, for the most part, white folks, but not exclusively, um, also feel that these communities have a certain level of crime, and so therefore the police have to use certain tactics, and they should be extended grace for having to use those tactics so that they could survive and go home. That is kind of the, 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 the thinking, the propaganda that's inundated by our community or about our community from other folks, which of course it plays a role in terms of how our community is treated. So I say that to say because this policing, uh, this military police uh, operation is really put on the, the foot of the idea that we need the police to solve issues of public safety, i.e. to solve issues of crime. And coming out of 2020, when the narrative was to fund the police, when the narrative was abolish the police, when the narrative was again finding alternatives to public safety, what happened was the corporate media decided with local and national politicians to instead create a new narrative, which was around this spike in crime that now we needed the police more than ever to be circulating in our communities uh, and arresting and harassing people. Yeah, it's interesting how that's going to play out in the long term because okay, we had George Floyd, we had more people in the streets than ever in American history. You had in that context, Joe Biden running for office, choosing a fund the police harder message. There were no electoral uh, electoral consequences for him basically narratively going completely against uh, what so many of his constituents wanted him to do because they felt like it was more important to vote out Donald Trump. Okay, now here we are two years into his presidency, with police reform seemingly scrapped, uh, the fight over qualified immu immunity seemingly killed the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act, which Biden said he wanted to pass within the one year anniversary of George Floyd's death, which was uh, almost two years ago now. Uh, the anniversary, the one year anniversary was almost two years ago now. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I guess I, I'm curious, I, I wanted you to talk a little bit more about your colleague, Micah Herskind, wrote a piece, I believe, on his Substack or on his blog, where he contextualized more broadly how much actually local pushback there was against this project, particularly from people who lived 
close to where Cop City is planned to be, noting that there was a, a notice and comment period of some kind where city council members heard something like 17 hours of calls, 70% of which were against the project. But when the hearings actually started, that evidence was largely ignored and everything just got kind of rubber stamped. Can you speak to that? Yeah. Well, you know, we have been doing the organizing in and around that community and across Atlanta, again, once we heard about the idea of Cop City. So the city council never held a public hearing until we forced them to hold one hearing. And at that one hearing, they would not take questions from the audience um, they only would take written questions and they only took around two or three. And so up until that mm-hmm. time, there was no questions or no, no avenue for participation from the larger community in the electoral process. On the day of the vote, before the call of the vote, there is a time period where citizens can call in to the city of Atlanta, to the city council and express whether they're for or against. This was the second largest amount of calls they ever received. The only Mm. amount more they received was when Rayshard Brooks was killed. Um, Mm. 70%, again, of those calls were against Cop City. And in fact, it would have been more than that, except for the fact that you had police and fire fire people calling in saying that they supported Cop City. And we know that because they stated their professions. And so Mm -hmm. people, another survey was done that said 90% of the people, again, who live adjacent in Southeast Atlanta, adjacent to the forts, said they were opposed to this being built. The city of Atlanta, the the mayor, the city council completely ignored this in favor of creating this cop city for the things that we mentioned. And in addition to appease the northern part of Atlanta, which is called Buckhead, which is a majority white part of town where most of the corporations and the economic development of Atlanta resides. And they are always talking and screaming about wanting more police. And so basically the mayor uh, has agreed to do this with the city council now uh, in a coalition with the right wing governor of Georgia, Governor Kemp. And in some ways, uh, because this task force, which has attacked organizers and activists, which is responsible for the killing of Tortuguita, is a task force that's comprised of local Atlanta police, the Cap County police, Georgia Bureau of Investigation, Georgia troopers, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, and Homeland Security. So both at the Mm -hmm. federal, state, and local levels, no matter what their ideology, they've all pushed to criminalize protesters and to make Cop City happen. What do you make of the role of Black mayors have been playing in all of these, um, in 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 the movement for police reform, abolition, generally speaking? I mean, I think Black mayors have been a joke. I think they basically continue to hold forth the interests of a white political and economic elite, not exclusively white, but mostly white, a corporate elite and a development elite whose main role in the cities all across this country have been to gentrify black and brown people, working class people, poor people out of these cities and to make them basically a playground for the corporate elite and for their workers. So basically American cities are taking on a French model of development, where the city centers are places where if you have resources and money, you can live. And if you're a worker, you basically have a sundown town, right? Without the explicit law, but with the economic effects of a sundown town. You can come here to work, but you can't afford to live here. And so you better be out by a certain time and or you better have a reason for living in these cities. Having a representative mayor who looks like us is only there to make it go down smoother. These mayors, their interest has been, they're no longer mayors who've come out of the history of the civil rights movements. Their history is connected to corporate development and developer interest. Um, and they're not connected at all to what's happening on the ground and fighting for working class people and fighting for the very black people who gave their votes up to put them into office. Yeah, it's so interesting that you you know kind of put it in that both racial and economic context. Um, you know, in Micah's piece, he talks about this being an extension of the military industrial con- complex and the warnings um, that were offered up 60 years ago about or 70 years ago about what that pretended and that it's a it's not, you know, it's a complex that doesn't require a conspiracy. Um, it's kind of something that falls in line naturally because of the economic incentive- incentives that exist. 
And I do, we've been having this conversation on Rising and Elsewhere about whether or not there's a way that, and I'd, I'd like you to both weigh in on this, whether or not framing some of these criminal justice issues so exclusively, almost exclusively in racial terms by something like the Black Lives Matter movement, understandably so given the case that sparked the 2020 uprisings and all of the cases that started BLM back to whatever 2014, you know, involving Black people, especially Black men. But in with the effort, with, you know, given that how much the political effort to have any kind of reform has stalled, and given the historical way that certain kind of economic messages have had longer legs in a country that is frankly often not interested in Black interests, you know, I wonder what you make of the case that says the tent should have been brought up and there should be more focus on the class dynamics of not just what happens in these you know, one-on-one -on -one interactions with the police, but more broadly in the criminal justice system. I'll go to you first, Matthew, because, you know, you very pointedly in your title of your book point to both the racial and class implications here. I mean, do you think there's a case to be made that we should be talking about the the class biases within the criminal justice system more to get more kind of political buy-in to reform? Yeah, so I'll just say, you know, I think the movement for Black Lives generally has done a pretty good job of sort of talking both about the racialized and racist aspects of the system and also talking about capitalism and the extract mm. components of the system, particularly, you know, thinking about the courts around sort of, uh, you know, legal financial obligations and, you know, post-Ferguson, right, in 2015, talking about how this is a system that is meant to exploit a certain group of people racially. And this is racial capitalism, right? Uh, mostly majority Black people, but mostly people who are working class and poor in order to boost revenue, right? Uh, to fill tax collection issues. You know, when there's a tax shortfall, police were asked to, you know, uh, police these poor Black communities. And so I definitely think that um, the conversation should be and in many spaces is a conversation about race and class. I think the problem has been that often the media, the sort of mainstream media, if you will, has been really, you know, in, in the United States, we don't really have a class analysis, to be mm -hmm. frank. Like, you know, the dominant conversation is rarely a class conversation. And so I think among uh, people in the movement for Black Lives, certain components, especially in the movement for Black Lives, especially more on the radical end, have been really clear about this being a both a race and class issue. But I think the way, you know, you get on TV and you see, oh my gosh, how can we make sense of, you know, Black police officers killing a Black person? Like, well, that's made sense in a context where you understand racial capitalism, you understand the Black radical tradition as a tradition that's focused on those who are most marginalized by these systems of oppression that are quite interlocking um, historically and contemporarily. And so I think having a class conversation is really important, Sh certainly should bring in more people. Um, you know, I think in, in my own work, I got to know a bunch of poor white folks who were uh, pulled into the criminal legal system and also poor Black folks who were. Um, and I've thought about and theorized around, you know, and understandings of uh, interrelated forms of criminalized subjectivity. At the same time, within that, there can be sort of blaming and, and uh, sort of distancing, right, among white people who are criminalized from people who are truly supposed to be of the criminal element, right? So there is racism within, right? Um, but at the same time, I think having this more complex conversation could bring more people in and is more truthful and accurate to the problem at hand. Right. Slavery, which we often talk about uh, slave patrols and sort of the modern formation of police departments and the history of that slavery was a system both of racial oppression and economic extraction. Right. Du Bois talked about how the black worker, right, or the enslaved person is, right, the most uh, exploited worker in the United States. Mm -hmm. So I think these conversations have definitely got to be had both on race and class dimensions. I mean, you, you bring up the, again, this this question of, you know, can it be racist if it's five black cops? You know, mm -hmm. when that, when that, the reality of who perpetrated it became public, my first thought was of the study, and tell me if you're familiar with it, Matthew, that showed that in death penalty cases, um, perps, perp, you know, you know the, the, the perpetrator was four times more likely to get the death penalty if the victim was white. Mm -hmm versus the person of being black, regardless of the race of the murderer. So, you know, this is exactly that case. It's not about what race the cops are. It's a question of whether or not black people are disproportionately victimized because their lives are seen as having less value. That's okay. like the whole point of Black Lives Matter. It also seems to me when I hear you talk about this, 
it's very familiar to me as someone who, you know, sat through a sociology class or two in college, but it does seem like there's something that's, there's like a gap, like something is missing when we've been talking about race and Black Lives Matter and all this for so long and people are still confounded. Even I think a lot of liberals are confounded by how people can make an argument that race is not irrelevant in Tyree Nichols' murder ju- just because mm. there were five black cops involved. And it's worth noting that there was additionally at least one white cop who interestingly has been scrubbed from uh, the narrative. Mm. But I, I want to put that to you as, as well, Kamal. Like, you know, there was a lot of conversation in Atlanta about what it might potentially mean for Stacey Abrams to be governor and if that would make a difference. And frankly, there was a lot of pushback I saw from, and let me know if you, this was your impression as well, from particularly Black men who didn't see her as particularly aligned. There were people who were concerned about various concessions she's made um, in years past uh, before her kind of gubernatorial runs to conservative interests in the state, whether or not it's over the uh, education program and and other kinds of things, and and some questioning about whether her interests really align on a class basis with a more working class and Black people in the state. And 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 I wonder, you know, I don't want to overstate the case, but there there's a strong argument I think that sometimes these Black faces in high places mm-hmm. do mm-hmm. do the job of justifying a fundamentally un, unjust system. And you know, I I I wonder what you make of that conversation, you know. We, we, the people kind of instinctively are understanding this. They're pushing back against the idea that these black political figures are going to help. We have this robust activist movement that's been doing so much work, both to turn out voters and get Biden elected and also to, to protest like they've been doing at Cop City and doing all of this stuff that's really authentic and grassroots. But somehow the translation that when it comes to the mainstream media is so simplistic that almost a decade into the Black Lives Matter movement, a couple of, you know, a handful of black cops kill someone, a, a kill a black man, and everyone's still shrugging their shoulders like, oh, I guess this, this one isn't a racism. I think we'll be, because we have to look at what the role of these institutions are in our lives, right? So none of these institutions are, are doing anything other than what they are built to do. The mainstream media, corporate media, is built to make people misunderstand their condition vis-a-vis Mar- American capitalism and American society and even white supremacy. So the, the media is doing its job when it's misleading people into thinking, one, that uh, the reason for poverty and or crime is that people just don't work hard enough and mm-hmm. that you need to value and look up to, you know, billionaires and millionaires, because only if you did what they did, could you also be sharing in this space. Right. So the media is doing its job. The media is owned by who corporations who are doing their job which is to extract wealth and resources from everyday people, to put people in debt, to have people have to borrow money, all to make them feel like they're important because they look like somebody else who's rich. The politicians are doing their job, which is to control the masses of people by using the public army of of the corporations, which is the police, which is to control communities, to control populations, to lock populations up as either excess labor, um, or to make sure that those populations don't rebel. So there's nothing to me in terms of what's happening that is surprising because I think that these folks are playing their role. I don't think that if we talked more about class, then somehow more folks would get it because I think historically speaking and currently, the white working class, for the most part, you know, not completely, not all, but for the most part, has sided with white supremacy to the a point of where they participated fully. And it's the, it's the white working class that does the lynching, so did the lynching. It's the white working class that are on the juries that are convicting black folks. It is the white working class that are voting for the Trumps um, and voting even for the Bidens as the best possible alternative to a Trump, right? So too many times the white working class seems bedeviled by questions of race because it's in their interest to be bedeviled by them because they still feel they're getting something out of it. Some of them do anyway. The ones who are revolting, they are the ones who feel like too much has been given to other people. And it's not like they want to do anything to change capitalism other than breaking sure that the very basics of their lives are brought back to what they feel like was the golden age in the 1950s when white folks had pensions, uh, when white folks had time offs, when white folks can have industrial jobs and they can pay for housing based on everyday salaries. And there was a more 
equal distribution of the wealth when it came to, let's say, the larger white mass within the United States. So it's not the interest, I think, of, of these folks to understand the racial complexity along with the uh, economic complexity. They choose not to because a lot of times, as I see it, it's not in their interest to do so because then there would be some real ramifications for that. Real quickly on the Stacey Abrams mm-hmm. type of thing, so, I, so, you know, other than black women, the, the right after black women, it was black men that supported Stacey Abrams. So I don't want to separate black women from black men in terms of their large overall support for her. Mm-hmm. Um, I think Stacey Abrams herself pushed aside working class black populations and working class populations in Georgia, particular, particularly black populations, to focus in on getting more white working class people to vote from her, vote for her and try to get them away from Kemp. That was noticed in her TV commercials, where she stood with the police, where she made sure that she was prominently saying that she supported the police. Those are the, are, those are the problems that the uh, electoral class, um, or as sometimes we say, the misleadership class uh, of Black elected officials put themselves in. They become careerists. They're more interested in getting these positions and serving the interests of, again, corporations and developers than they are in serving the interests of working class people, no matter who they are, but particularly working class black people and poor people. So I am largely with you, but I want to mm-hmm. I want to push mm-hmm. back against a little bit of that. Mm-hmm. One, with respect to Stacey Abrams, I, I agree that that is what she did. And, I, and you didn't you didn't. I want to push back against the idea. I'm not saying that you said this, but this kind of tacit idea that to attract the white working class, which is not only necessary in a state like uh, Georgia to win, but I think morally justified. You absolutely should be able to appeal to working class people in a broad multiracial coalition to be in office today. So that, but the idea that in order to do that, one has to push away black working class voters. I think is something that a lot of Democrats believe, but is not the case. I think it only becomes a zero sum game when you believe that the only thing that can appeal to white working class folks is standing next to the police and saying, I'm going to fund them harder and doing all of this kind of malarkey. In fact, my experience, which of course, uh, nowhere near what your experiences are, come out working in this sector and in the community directly. But just as a media figure and watching the responses that I get from the various segments that we get on Rising, which is a very bipartisan, ideologically mixed audience, is there is a lot of appetite for certain kinds of police reform, uh, particularly when it comes to framing the police as an arm of the state that is overreaching and infringing on people's freedoms. And when we bring up people like Daniel Shaver, who I don't know if you recall, he was a white man who was murdered very brutally by the police on camera. It's very similar to Tyree in some ways, insofar as he was given a bunch of contradictory directions that he couldn't follow. It was like, you're on your knees with your hands behind your head. Now crawl toward me. And he's like, well, I have to put my hands down to crawl. And, you know, he went to pull up his pants and they shot him just horrifically. Right. And when you bring up those kinds of videos and when you talk about how I think, Matt, earlier you said, you know, most you know, most of the victims are black. Well, it's not, it's disproportionately, but the, mm-hmm. the most people in jail are white just because of the demographics of the country, right? Most people who have interactions with the police are white just because of the, these negative interactions are white just because of the demographics of the country, even though it's black people are dramatically overrepresented. So I, I do wonder whether or not emphasizing that reality that most people who are going to be affected by a lot of these programs are in fact white, kind of undermines the movement or sells it short a little bit, and also sets up these weird, these the, these weird trade offs that politicians believe they have to make between siding with the police to get white people, at the same time they're alienating all these black people. Well, I think for, I well, I think you nailed it when you said her way of reaching white audiences, particularly white working class audiences was making sure that she did commercials to show that she was tough on crime. Right. Right. So that puts into the perception, again, a perception that's already there for white people through, again, corporate media, that the criminals that we're talking about are black people. And if she's willing to do that, then maybe we can vote for her. Right. But if she's thinking about redistributing resources, which will go to black people, then we're not going to be with her. Because even if the statistics show, right, 
At one point, welfare was a very popular program in mm-hmm. the United States. When was it popular? When it's distributed mostly to white women. Public housing was considered a very popular program. When was it popular? After the GI Bill, it was built and so uh, uh, veterans could come back and live in homes. And who are the majority of those folks? White folks. So as soon as it becomes associated with a Black need, or Black folks are also getting this, the race question kicks in over the economic question too many times. Is it fair? Is it correct? Do people need to think that through? Of course they do. But that's what happens. And then when these politicians, who, who know a lot of this stuff themselves, play into it, that becomes an issue. And then when we don't challenge our white liberal counterparts to come to an understanding around how racism works, but to instead tell us that we need to talk less about it because it pisses off or scares away white folks, then we have a bigger problem because then we're not really dealing with the issues of race and we only want to deal with the issues of economics. And those two cannot be separated when it comes to the United States of America. So th- this is can, this has been a... I, oh, go ahead. Go ahead yeah, yeah. I just wanted to jump in to say, I think Kamau's spot on on the historical analysis. And I will say one thing, though, that I'm thinking about, and, and I think that a lot of organizers are thinking about, is the possibility of getting at the symbolic wages of whiteness, right? So this is the fundamental issue here, right? Is this idea that of white supremacy, this idea that white people, right, have a benefit, a symbolic benefit, white working class people of their whiteness, right? And so that allows for maintenance of all sorts of forms of social control and policing, but it's also quite productive. Ideologically, it's productive for capitalism, right, because it divides up the working class. And so I think historically that has is accurate and true in the United States. But I do uh, think that there's a lot of work that people are doing on the ground that all of us are doing to try to expand, right, understandings of people's interests and in what they actually are, right? And uh, get rid of this idea that whiteness is actually in the interest of working class white people. Um, and so I think that's one avenue that we need to be fighting in this sort of articulation of what I described as like expanding and encouraging a class analysis is showing how so much of the problems, so many of the problems, whether it's an opioid epidemic, it's going against, right, Obamacare and thinking it's not in your interests, it's uh, ideas of thinking that police should have, right, increased social control of neighborhoods, even though there are clear collateral consequences that are affecting white working class white people and poor people. Um, getting rid of that ideologically, I think, is a battle that is worth it in order to expand, right, um, understanding and analysis to be able to get rid of these broader systems of oppression that are interlocking. I mean, to that end, Matthew, I think that's exactly right. But this is this is kind of what I'm asking. You know, there's a world where Stacey Abrams, instead of standing next to some cop in an ad, goes out, trolls the press and police logs for every example of a white person killed by a police officer in Georgia over the last 10 years or whatever. And doesn't add where she says this country was founded on the ability of people to be free from the control of the state and state oppression. And yet we have a police force that's been funded to the tune of however million, many million dollars, which represents whatever horrible, ridiculous pr- percentage of our budget that has been used to infringe upon the rights of law abiding citizens. Take Sam this and Bill this and Joseph this and name the names and show the faces and say, as governor of Georgia, I'm going to stand up for the right of all Georgians to live their lives freely without fear of the police. Now, maybe that's craven. (laughs) Maybe I'm a a sicko for wanting to to go in that route. But there is a, and you bring up these welfare, welfare programs, even though welfare became less popular and was associated with black people, it has never been the case that the majority of welfare recipients weren't white. You know, and it has become almost like unpalatable to say that, like it's somehow undermining the disproportionality of how black people suffer from poverty or police violence or whatever to acknowledge that the majority is still white and that there is there's I think it, it reads as somehow, I don't know, uncouth or distasteful to try to cater to white people on the basis that they have sincere interest. They have a sincere interest in these social programs being um, supported. They have a sincere interest in cops not killing people. Like, because they're the people. It's you. It, it you, you know? 
And, 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 and that like boggles my mind. People like Tanya see Coates write so persuasively about the problems in America and then about how programs are negatively stigmatized when they are associated with blackness at the same time that there's this urging to double down and to make it really clear that people need to reckon with the racism and get past their racism so we can fix this. I mean, a shortcut conceivably could be instead of trying to cure racism on a kind of two to four year election cycle, God bless everyone who's trying, but like, I'm not overly optimistic. You simply say, okay, be you're racist. Well, forget about black people. This is in your best interest. Like, why is that such a... <laughs> Why is that such a crazy? I don't know if I think it's, you know, you still because you're still not dealing, not not you, but, you know, the, the country yeah. is still not dealing with also capitalism. Right. And because people are also wedded to the along with their racism, they're also wedded to the idea that capitalism works and that rich people are rich because they worked harder. And so even even if they're racist against certain uh, black folks or, or, or Latino folks or folks of color, there's also the class stigma that even when you're poor, you're not as poor as the other person. Doesn't or stressing, you have a little something. Doesn't stressing that most poor people in America are white get to the heart of that perception? Doesn't it make it difficult for white people to believe? No, not that, at all. Because that, I, that, but do white people, put it like, you're not the first to come up with the analysis, and I know you're not trying to be the first. And Bernie Sanders is not the first to come up with the analysis either. Folks have been socialist left white folks who for years, decades, centuries have argued along the line that a class analysis is needed to break through and to really bring the so-called working class together to fight for common cause against their rich oppressors, so forth and so on. Time and time again, one, the state marshals its resources against any serious challenge against that whether or not that's a propaganda battle or a police battle on the streets, which the courts and so forth are used. So it's not like those things work in a vacuum, right? They're all state resources that are put against it. And those resources also include an ideological battle, which continues to be fought against everybody and anybody, right? But the problem because becomes for me is that too many of the folks who are saying to do that um, they have not convinced a majority of the white folks that they're talking about to come out of their, their racist shell and to do the, the hard work of working with large. That's kind of identity. my point. My, my point is getting Which, at the not why my work that to is. Do, though. Yeah. No, no I, I'm getting yeah, at the yeah. point of why that is. And from my perception, even in the Bernie campaign, I'm not seeing people making that express argument that this is, you know, most poor people are white. Like I hear the Repub the conservative argument that says, don't care about this social issue because it's for black people. I see that loud and clear. I don't see the left or liberal countervailing argument that says, actually the people who are poor are white. Actually the people, no, they double down. The, the liberal message is, is that yes, the people who are poor are black and therefore you should care about them. And there's this idea of like appealing to a kind of guilt uh, for the, assuming that people aren't racist and that they want to rectify racial inequity. And so they stress, yes, all the people, mar historically marginalized groups, oppressed groups, these are the people who are being impacted. Don't you care? Don't you want to support this? And this, the, the opposite is true, right? I mean, are, am I wrong? Do you, I, do I you see someone out there making this argument? I mean, I think the difficulty of that argument is that many white people in America have and, and this is sort of the power of whiteness, have sort of accepted the collateral consequence, right? So we're talking about, so yes, it may be true that more poor people or more white people are poor than, you know, of any other racial group, or there are more, um, there are more uh, people incarcerated who are white than who are black, right? These things may be true, but of course we're talking about disproportionality, right? We're talking about what a system is intending and targeting and what the intention behind that system is, and then we're talking about, right, sort of collateral effects of a system. And so I think this is actually, right, one of Michelle Alexander's arguments around the new Jim Crow is this idea, right, that here is a new form of racialized social control. This form of racialized social control is racially targeted, but it might have some collateral effects on non-Black people. And what white supremacy does and what whiteness has done historically in the United States has accepted those collateral effects. And so I think it is important to have an argument 
and to try to convince people that those collateral effects are unacceptable, right? I mean, yes, even referring to them as collateral totally, effects makes it sound totally. like, oh, there's just a sprinkling no, of white no. people hurt. Don't worry about it, white people. Yeah. It's fine. Yeah, you know? no. And I think that's, that's how what they, is that's being how done. Applied, that's yeah. how it's being articulated. And that is morally that, terrible. And, but and that's, that's how it's that being... Is, that, that is my point. I think it's a problem that we are characterizing these things as even... Like, I would like a frame... But, but Brianna, I think it's a white problem. More, more so than a problem of radicals in the movement for Black lives. I think many people on the ground see it both as a race and class problem and do take it as a morally problematic thing that anyone is being killed by. Well, oh, no, I anyone agree. Anyone being incarcerated. But I, I don't think it's a white problem. I think it's a media problem. I think that people who, like prominent Black figures in the media and prominent Black f- politicians are very quick to describe these things as collateral effects and to talk about how we need to care about social programs because they're Black. Every Democratic Party candidate gets on the TV during an election year and says, we've got to save Social Security because, Mm -hmm. you know, Black seniors disproportionately rely on Social Security for 90 percent of their income or whatever. I know because I said it like we all had we all trot those stats out in the middle of a campaign to appeal to various ethnic groups. Mm -hmm. And I guess I'm challenging the wisdom of having exclusively that approach instead of approach that says, no, the main people harmed, not collaterally, the main people harmed by all of this in a country that is still 70% white is white people. And to be more express about the fact that I actually want to help you white people, not, <laughs> not, not white people, you know, like you're also getting hurt when black people are getting hurt or Latinos are getting hurt or Native Americans are getting hurt. But like, these are programs that are, that are overwhelming, like the overwhelming People, a bulk of people damaged are in fact white people. It's not collateral. It's central. You, you are, you're central. Your harm is central to this project here, which again, people don't like because it feels like it's like minimizing the disproportionate effects on black people. I understand why there's like this like psychic resistance to it, but it can, it confounds me because I see white people big mad at the FBI right now. I see white people big mad at the idea of the states taking over. And I've seen white people even during the Trump administration. Remember, there was all that Van Jones stuff with um, qualified immunity. There was this this libertarian part of the Dem- of Republican Party that was invested in this idea of criminal justice reform because they didn't like how much it cost to lock people up. Frankly, it wasn't like humanitarian necessarily. But there were these the simpatico that was forming around those issues. Right, sort of the right on crime movement. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, let me let me come back to you, Matthew, on this, because. The George Floyd Justices and Policing Act mm-hmm. was scuttled largely over this issue of qualified immunity. And mm-hmm. some Democrats have said we should let this go. This came up again in the context of the Tyree Nichols uh, murder that, you know, because, um, you know, we need to talk about criminal justice reform again. And if we need to get something passed, anything passed, this is so serious. This was such a horrible thing that happened. Therefore, we should just let go of qualified immunity. From your perspective, how important is qualified immunity to this project of reform? And what do you what do you think of Democrats who would who would let that go in order to pass something? Yeah, you know, I mean, the George Floyd Act, I think, had many issues and problems, especially for people who are thinking about a more radical and structural change to the way that policing is operating in the United States and actually scaling down policing. Because in many ways, the George Floyd Act does legitimate policing in some instances, right? And I think the issue around qualified immunity, though, is, you know, I think it's important to get rid of qualified immunity. Um, I'm not sure it would solve the vast problem of police violence in the United States. But yeah, I think it's important. It would be great to pass legislation that gets rid of qualified immunity. You know, personally, I think I was more excited in 2021 around that time with the Breathe Act, which, you know, was sort of a proposal that came out of the Movement for Black Lives that was much more intentional and thoughtful about non-reformist reforms and even small sort of partial abolitions like getting rid of the DEA and things like that, that could Mm. move us toward a world where we are vastly uh, diminishing the presence of policing in the United States, at least, uh, you know, centered really on the federal level, but could have sort of implications for state and local policing. Um, You know, I think what's happening around the George Floyd Act is, you know, post-2020, the fact that we could not get that act passed says a lot, I think, about politics, where we are, and also says a lot, too, about elite political action. And, you know, if we think in contrast to what's happening on the ground in local communities post-2020, and in many instances, there's a lot of local action that's happening, too, to try to reduce the imprint of policing that in some ways has been successful. 
Um, so, you know, as much as I think federal, you know, federal action is really important, it, it, it sends a signal to changing policing. It gives incentive structures, right? Uh, potentially like removing funding from police departments if they don't compel with certain aspects. But at the same time, it's actually maybe not the thing that's really going to reduce police violence in this country. And I think there are other alternatives that we could really uh, work for politically. And so, you know, to see... Um, I mean, like, like what? Kamala because... Harris. Mm-hmm. Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. What yeah, about I was Kamala just to, say, to see, you know, Vice President Kamala Harris say we need to pass the George Floyd Act out. Like, yes, that's great. That's exciting. But also there are so many other things that we need to be doing. And I don't know if that is going to be the panacea, right, to bring about a severe reduction in police violence in the United States. Well, well thinking about what's happening on the local level, I mean, Kamal, I'm looking at you in Atlanta. And I'm looking at there was this notice and comment period. The community was very clear about what they wanted and didn't want. And then local government says, screw it, we're going to do this anyway. Now a man is laid, lays dead who knows how, the, what fault and blame and what's going to come out of that, of that case. But do you, are you, are you hopeful about what kind of reforms can happen on a, on a local level in a predominantly black city with a black mayor where the public seems to agree that this is not a good idea and you're still, you're still in this zone, you know? Well, no, I'm not, I'm not hopeful of federal reform or local reform, right? I'm hopeful mm. for organizing on the streets, which exacts uh, changes or does things that forces people to do things that they don't want to do. But outside of that, outside of continued mass mobilization, organizing, radical behavior, again, I think elected officials, whether Democrat or Republican, um, for the most part, they're siding with corporate interest. And that is at the federal level, and that is at the state level, and that is at the city level. At the city level, even at the height of the defund movement or the abolishment movement, there might have been some small things that got passed. But for the most part, city after city, police budgets increased. They didn't decrease. They increased. There was never a moment when they decreased. So it says clearly that what they did was ride a wave, but they stuck to what they believed in. And what they believed in, again, whether that they were Democrats or Republicans, because most of these killings that do happen against Black people are happening in cities that are run by Democrats, right? Mm -hmm. In police forces that are supposed to be under the most liberal type of leadership. Mm -hmm. But this leadership that is liberal is really disconnected at the hip to the interests of corporations and developers and the idea of what they think it takes to run a city, which again, these folks believe in. They're not acting against what they think their interests are. They're not being tricked into it. Um, they're doing what they think their interests are, which is to be connected to these folks. So I never believed and or expected much out of a Joe Biden, knowing last last year at the State of the Union address, he's shouting, don't defund the police, but fund the police, right? We all know the knew that going into it. So there will be no really hopes for me as a sort of grassroots organizer or someone who has radical politics that the system as it is, is going to ever abolish and do a defund the very public police that they rely upon to protect themselves and to protect corporate and developer interests. That's the very role they were created to play. There's yeah. no reason to suspect that we are going to talk them into, hey, why don't you just do this because it's going to cause less harm? Yeah. It's going so, to what is, I, is, so what does that look like to you? I mean, you're looking at Tortuguita, who was doing exactly the kind of grassroots protest, occupying this land, that one would imagine you're, you're describing, at least in part. And he's been killed. We've seen a ratcheting up of criminal penalties for all types of protests across the country, including these environmental protests, with Jessica Resni- Resni- Resniak and serving a nine-year jail sentence for property damage with a pipeline. Nine years. You know, there were a number of Black Lives Matter protesters that come, you know, were disappeared and, you know, all of this discourse around the lack of coverage about what happened to so many people who were involved in that protest. And yet, there's been no political response. To your point, maybe we shouldn't be optimistic for it. What we've seen is a ratcheting up of funding to the police and criminalizing protest. Are you imagining a different kind of protest uh, an escalation of protests, even in the face of harsher penalties? You know, do, do you think, you know, it requires a, a stronger message? Do you think there should be more of a commitment to 
defund. So many people have backed off in, uh, in recent years. The only people who are talking about defund right now are Marjorie Taylor Greene talking about defund the FBI. I mean, that's an exaggeration, obviously. Not the only people. You're obviously an abolitionist. But I mean, what people want to know. People want to... Is it the kind of thing you just don't want to say on the air? I mean, where do you see no, this I think going, a lot, I mean, it, it, There's a lot of things to be done. I mean, I, mm-hmm. what I've seen out of the history of the last, even the last eight years, I say since Trayvon Martin was killed, um, time and time again, has been a co-opting of radical movements and mobilizations on the street. And what I mean by co-opting, I mean, those movements have been driven into the Democratic Party, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so whether we, whether or not they meant well, whether or not they had great politics, when resources were extended to these movements, a lot of these movements became basically arms of the Democratic Party that said mm-hmm. that you must sort of in some ways you're demobilizing and you're getting people to the voting booth. Right. And that's always been the way of the larger society. Right. People who are once enemies become friends. When we look back at the 60s and 70s and the Black Power movement and the mobilizations during that time period, the part of the movement that was destroyed was the radical movements of the 60s and 70s, the Black Power Movement, the Black Panther Party, other organizations during that time period. People were killed. People were locked in prison. Organizations were destroyed. What was left standing was civil rights activity and voting rights activity as the way to integrate, to seek equality, to seek equity, to seek uh, to be Black capitalists into a system, right? So we should know by now that the history of America is to destroy radical movements because it fears radical movements. Radical movements must not be co-opted by what they can see is that the Democratic Party writ large, ex- for you know, with some few exceptions, is only meant to keep its own system going. So yes, we need mass mobilizations and radical action and large organizations, local, national, international, in the streets. We need to do things like general strikes when we have the power to do them. We need to do things like create uh, mass uh, 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 economic alternatives in our communities when we have the resources to do them. We need to do things like find alternatives to the police, including doing our own policing in our community through safety walks and other things. But we need to be organized, organized, organized. Every time we rely on Democrats to pass a resolution a law, a new piece of legislation, we lose momentum because the only thing that they're going to do is pass weak reform as they try to get us to vote them in so they can continue to do the things that they do for corporations. Lastly, there's not that big a difference between the Republicans and the Democrats, in my estimation, and or conservatives and liberals, except conservatives are like, kill them all, put them in jail outright. Liberals are more like, no, 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 no. We can let a few in to control the rest. We can create a paradigm where we create a small black middle class in particular that can make other people want to achieve that. And so therefore, we will buy time and buy them off. And that's how we mobilize. But in the end, just like on foreign policy, most of the domestic policy strategies are the same. And so we rely on two parties that have historically been opposed to us and against us then we will always come up on the short end waiting for legislation to pass, which will never solve the problems in the first place. Yeah. Can I also say, I just want to second everything Kamal said, but I I just want to add an underscore, you know, this is a long range vision and struggle, right? You know, I think a lot of people were really animated 2012 with Trayvon, of course, uh, but definitely post Ferguson and Michael Brown's murder. Um, that's not a long time horizon. And of course we have Amadou Diallo. We have so many other, we have many people in the sixties who were shot by police that led to protests in Detroit, New York, throughout the country. And so this has been happening for a long time as a struggle, but actually that time horizon is not actually that long in the history of, right, policing systems and how we think about social control more broadly under capitalism. And so I think this is a struggle that we're always committing ourselves to. And I'll also say, and underscore the reality that there is a electoral politics, there is a going to town halls, that kind of politics, and then there's an everyday politics. There's what we're doing in our individual lives. And I think one really powerful aspect of the movement for Black Lives has been to uh, change the way many people think about their orientations toward policing, when and how and whether they should actually be calling the police. 
mm-hmm. thinking about how to de-escalate in their own communities and situations. I'm thinking a lot here, too, of Ruha Benjamin's new book, Viral Justice, which really encourages us. I think she refers to it as sort of a micro-level vision of uh, sort of everyday abolitionism or everyday change and thinking about what we owe each other in our communities and in our interactions with one another. You know, just in my own sort of everyday life, um, you know, here in Palo Alto, I've been spending time volunteering at the Palo Alto Food Closet, which is sort of a, it's like a food um, uh, pantry. And, you know, sometimes people come and they have, either going through a mental health crisis, they um, are having beef, right, with someone who, who also is picking up food at this, at that time. And, and the, the woman who runs the food closet has been really fantastic. I don't think she's actually trained in you know, like violence, interruption, and de-escalation, but she's really been intentional about not calling the police mm. and helping to de-escalate these situations. And so I think that can be really powerful, especially if we're constantly reminding ourselves of the need for that, constantly having conversations with one another about the need to not rely on policing and build up our own community-generated forms of social support and safety. I think those are both really great points to end on. We've we've been here for over an hour. I have some I have some things. I mean, I know the audience come out when you, when you say we should do general strikes when we have re- resources to do some, do them. We should, you know, that that caveat when we have the resources to do some do them strikes some people on the left as this like forever someday view of organizing where it's like we sh- we it has to all come down to labor but labor isn't organized and the labor force is such a small percent of the population and so we got to build up but then there's all these anti-labor laws and it's not getting any better and so at what point is there ever going to be that moment well there's been we... moments already i'm sorry to interrupt you i mean but there's no, no, been moments ahead, already where we've seen the power of people to impact and affect change the question becomes for the sort of liberal left is that are they going to end their relationship with a party, right? Or with parties which have not done the same or have not worked in the interest of working class and poor people? Yes, or but are I, they going to? Yeah, I, right, I, I could not agree more. And th- and this is, I think, I'm so glad you're saying that because many people are unwilling to. That I, my personal belief is the belief that the Democratic Party is actually going to work for you is one of the biggest obstacles impeding progress because it creates a a certain investment in a system that isn't going to work, resources being poured into it that aren't going to work. I think about all the activists that worked so hard to get uh, to win Georgia for Democrats, Black people (laughs) working their ass off to get Joe Biden in office and then to win the state the, the, to win those Senate seats so that uh, so that uh, Biden could do what exactly with them over the last two years? Like, I don't want to overstate the case, you know, but like it it pains me to see, know what to think about what those resources could be doing otherwise. And I'm not hearing uh, people I admire a great deal. The William Barbers of the world, um, Latasha, uh, Latasha Brown. I mean, I'm not hearing people say we shouldn't. You should divest from the Democratic Party, invest in other kinds of efforts. And I'm certainly not hearing them say anything in in the way of like pointed criticisms of Joe Biden and his inaction. In fact, I I was going to bring this up and, you know, we ran out of time, but I don't know if you remember that leaked call that Biden had with all the civil rights leaders in the fall of 2020. I can't get it off my mind. It seems like the whole Mm. world forgot about it. I can't stop thinking about it. And in it, Sherilyn Eiffel, at the time, they didn't know that they were going to get Georgia. So she runs through a whole list of things that Joe Biden can do by executive order to further the interests of the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act and criminal justice reform, generally speaking. And his reaction is basically to tell her off mm-hmm. and to tell her he doesn't have to do anything that she says. And like, he's going to design his own agenda and she needs to shut up. I mean, I'm exaggerating, but you can go listen to yeah, the tape yourself yeah, or maybe yeah. we'll clip it in. And so there's some things that I'm going to be able to do by executive order. I'm not going to hesitate to do it. But what I'm not going to do is I'm not going to do what used to... Benita, you probably used to get angry with me during the debates when you'd have some of the people you were supporting said, on day one, I'm going to executive order to do this. Not within the constitutional authority. I am not going to violate the Constitution. Executive authority that my progressive friends talk about is way beyond the bounds. And as one of you said, maybe you, Reverend now, whether it's far left or far right, There is a constitution 
It's our only hope, our only hope. And the way to deal with it is where I have executive authority, I will use it to undo every single damn thing this guy has done by executive authority. But I'm not going to exercise executive authority where it's questioned, where I can come along and say, I can do away with assault weapons. There's no executive authority to do away with that. And no one's fought harder to get rid of assault weapons than me. Me. But you can't do it by executive order. If you do that, next guy comes along and says, well, guess what? By executive order, I'm going to say everybody can own machine guns again. So, I, and that, then that thing leaks. And instead of everybody like saving face and being like, yeah, Biden, you need to listen to us. We just got you elected. Everyone just hushes up and like covers for him. And, and here comes Al Sharpton, who was on the call talking about, oh, it's OK that we're not doing George Floyd justice and policing. It's rather it's better to have a perfect act than a good a, a good act yeah. than a perfect act. Because who is he in the lineage of? Right. So even when we talk and I probably have a little bit more criticisms for Black Lives Matter movement um, uh, for my positioning. Right. But even in the positioning of the Black Lives Matter movement, like, they're not alone in terms of his, the historical development of it. Where did yeah. they get that from? They got that from Al Sharpton. Where did he get that from? He got that from Jesse Jackson. You know, so these things are within a historical line. The problem is, is that the, the left movement, what there is of a left movement, or could be of a left movement, has not re recalibrated, reasserted itself in any way which has been sustainable outside of this, outside of sort of party affiliations. And that's the work to me that has to get done, right? Yeah. And so when I say the resources, I mean, I don't mean necessarily the money resources, but we have to build up the infrastructure, the I people. See. We have to get people out there to see that there's other work that can be done. And even if we have, and I have many friends, this, you know, even as I'm pointedly, you know, anti a lot of work in the electoral arena, it's not like I think there's no work to be done there, right? I just think it's overemphasized in terms of a tool for liberation. And that means different things to different people, right? But it's an overemphasized. But I think even my friends there who know it's overemphasized, once you get in it, it's hard to get out. These organizations have upwards of 20 to 30 to 40 to 50 million dollar budgets. Now they're employing hundreds of people, thousands of people, right? So they're to do not what? <laughs> to vote <laughs> to... Democrat. They may put a little <sighs> pressure, but for the most part, that's what the that's what the day's role is. And that's who gets, you know. They get all of those resources to do so. And, you know, some of them think they're not doing it, but a lot of them are doing it. And they're just using more progressive or radical language when the end result is, oh, yeah, but get to get get out and vote. Let's get you registered to vote. I'm not trying to I'm not trying to pin this on you, Matthew, but I'm <laughs> like. People need to stop. Like, don't vote. No. <laughs> Withhold your vote. Ask, demand something for your vote. Like, as Ice, as Ice Cube said and got maligned for saying, at the very least, ask for the bare minimum uh, in exchange for your vote before you start lighting up the polls. Over the last four days, the Democratic National Party held a convention. A lot of people, you know what I mean, getting up there and talking and you know, everybody really, you know, eating it up, you know, throwing their hands in the air like they just don't care damn near. So it's, it's uh, you know, what I didn't hear is what's in it for us? What's in it for the black community besides the same old thing we've been getting from these uh, parties? Matthew. You've both been so generous with your time. I'll start with you, Matthew. Let people know where to find you on the internet, where to find your book and follow your work. Yeah, so my book's called Privilege and Punishment, How Race and Class Matter in Criminal Court. Uh, you can find it on Princeton University Press's website or uh, many local bookstores like Marcus Books here in uh, Oakland has uh, copies. Uh, so feel free to look it up there. Thanks, Bree, for having me. Of course, Matthew. And Kamal, where can people find you and your work on the internet and beyond? Uh, so on the internet, communitymovementbuilders.org, they can find us and all the different work that we do. Um, they can go to stopcopcity.org, I believe, to find out more about that movement to Stop Cop City. Um, and again, thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure to have the discussion with both of you. Oh, also tell people where they can find um, uh, the Black Power Media Network. Oh, now. so thank you so much for that. You just <laughs> saved me. Uh, so they can go to blackpowermedia.org on YouTube. Our channel is Black Power Media. 
You can hear all the alternative news that's centered in Black self-determination, Black power, Black organizing. You can find it there to help you find your guide to get into organizing and activism and fighting for Black folks. That's terrific. Come out. you should have a, not as I'm, I'm trying to do programming for you, but you should do a abolish the FBI panel and I will happily come on to moot the pro FBI abolishment side of things because I've been itching for that particular fight. And I loved Let's what you it. had Let's to say about it. abolish the DEA. I, I'm going to look into that more and see if maybe I should do a follow-up episode on that. Thank you both again for joining. Thank you to all the listeners. As you know, you can get an additional episode of Bad Faith Podcast every Monday over at patreon.com slash badfaithpodcast for $5 a month. You help support independent media and these wonderful free conversations like the one you just listened to. As always, take care of yourselves, keep the faith, and I will see you later tonight on Call In to Discuss. Take care. Hey, YouTube. Thanks for watching. Just a reminder that this is a podcast. You can catch an extra premium episode every Monday for $5 a month at patreon.com slash badfaithpodcast. That's patreon.com slash badfaithpodcast for $5 a month, an extra episode every week. Additionally, please do consider liking this video, subscribing to this channel. It helps us out. It helps independent media beat the algorithm. We appreciate you. And as always, keep the faith.